remarkable people. Um, one of those is, of course, Richard Titmus himself. This is the Richard Titmus uh, lecture um, for the, um, sponsored by the Department of Social Policy, of which Richard Titmus, of course, was probably our most distinguished um, member. Uh, he, uh, he was uh, a remarkable man in many ways. He was the last person, I think, to get a chair at the LSE without having an undergraduate degree. Um, he was, of course, as most people here will know, he was uh, one of the major architects of the development of the British welfare state, and not only the British welfare state, but uh, welfare states in a number of countries across the world uh, during the 1940s, 50s, and 60s, and indeed the 1970s. Um, but he was also a profound thinker, a philosopher, uh, and a social policy analyst um, of uh, uh, a most distinguished kind. Um, and uh, it's a great honor, in fact, to help hold his chair, and it's a great honor for us to be able to hold this lecture, and particularly uh, for the second uh, remarkable man that we're honoring tonight, which is um, Professor Sir Tony Atkinson. Uh, uh, Tony is, uh, I think, probably, I think almost without question, the most uh, distinguished uh, academic uh, in the United Kingdom and indeed in the world working on the issue of inequality and poverty. Um, he started, actually, we were just talking about this, his first book was called Poverty um, and the Reform of Social Security, uh, Poverty in England, Britain, the Britain and Reform of Social Security. And he's now working on the other end of the scale, so to speak, top incomes uh, from a global perspective. Uh, so he has run the gamut of these things. Um, as uh, people will know who've read The Guardian today, um, uh, he is uh, very highly regarded uh, throughout uh, uh, the, uh, the UK, throughout the academic community. Uh, he has held chairs uh, in the most prestigious British universities, um, Oxford, Cambridge, and he's now a centennial professor here. Uh, he has held chairs at the F.W. Torsig Chair of, uh, at Harvard. Um, and uh, he has shone, I think, a more profound light, if light can be profound, a more profound light uh, on the questions of inequality, on the measurement of inequality, on the, uh, the state of inequality, and on the causes of inequality, and what can be done about it, uh, than anybody, uh, any other living academic uh, that I know of. Uh, and he's going to, here tonight, I think, to shine a little more light on precisely those topics. So without further ado, Tony, over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Julian, for your very kind introduction. I think one conclusion I drew from the newspaper this morning is that the truth is that you shouldn't believe everything you read in The Guardian. <laughs> if you've read it, by the way, I was not the rear end of a pantomime horse. I think I was front end of a pantomime <laughs> <laughs> But anyway, that's uh, it's a It's a great pleasure and honor to be asked to give this memorial lecture for Richard Titmus. Someone whose work I greatly admire and continue to admire. Indeed, the main conclusion of this lecture is that his masterly study of uh, income distribution, published some 50 years ago, remains of considerable validity today. We met on a small number of occasions. Uh, I remember particularly we were both at a conference together in 1970 in Canada. And of course, as is probably well known, he, he didn't like economists. Uh, in the gift relationship, he quoted the famous phrase from Keynes that he hoped that one day economists could manage to get themselves thought of as humble, competent people on a level with dentists. <laughs> and then he us went on to say, this day has not yet dawned. But he was very, very kind to me, and I think that uh, I very much appreciated the interest he took. But I still have, in my copy of Income Distribution and Social Change, I've kept the card he wrote to me. It was dated uh, Christmas Eve, 1972, suggesting that we might have a meet to just talk about it. And sadly, he died very shortly after that. So it's the reason why I chose to take this book, 
but I might have called it income distribution and social change revisited. But in fact, I used that title for a lecture I gave to the Social Administration Association some 10 years after the publication of the book. Hence, the current title, after 50 years. And if you think about the series, 10, 50, dot, 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 you can work out there won't be a sequel. <laughs> this is the last one. <coughs> now, as I said just now, the, I think that the key messages from that book remain valid today. And the key messages I set out here just with brief quotations from the book. And they are the importance of official statistics on the distribution of income. And because of that importance, the need to examine them critically. And this critical examination goes beyond technical issues. The statistics need, as is said in the quotation, to look at the underlying economic and social change. We were led away from a severely statistical approach to a consideration of the long-run forces affecting the economic and social structure of British society. And finally, behind all this is clearly a concern with policy. That is, the reason we're interested in these statistics is very much because of the, what we, conclusions we can draw in terms of the development and reform of policy. And I left this quotation here for about the role <coughs> played in terms of influencing the Chancellor, which I included partly because this quotation, which comes from the 1944 White Paper on Employment Policy, I think perhaps as a reminder how much with our current Chancellor we seem perhaps to have gone back in time. <coughs> so it's this set of key messages that led to the structure for the lecture. I'm going to begin by talking about the official statistics and give a rather high-speed history of what's happened in the last 50 years. There have <coughs> been major changes, major improvements, even if progress has been somewhat lacking in being uniform over time. But we have to ask, despite these progress has been made, the same question that Titmuss asked of the Inland Revenue Statistics in 1962, how far do they adequately capture reality? And that's what the second section of the lecture will be about. And then in the third, I shall turn to the interpretation of social change, and finally, in section four, with some implications for policy, with an eye, of course, to present-day policy issues, and particularly issues <coughs> raised by the current coalition government. Now, I've had to be very selective and I should say at the outset that I'm concentrating in this lecture on the distribution of economic resources, income and wealth. If you say to me there are other important dimensions of well-being, then I will completely agree with you. I think that's clearly right. Income and wealth are only part of the story. But income is an important dimension, and we only have 50 minutes. So I'm going to stick to what it said on the invitation to the lecture what you're getting is what's on the poster. And finally, by way of introduction, I noticed in the preface to Income Distribution and Social Change, the author says the book has been both helped and hindered on its journey by advice and comments from friendly critics and critical friends. Now, I can make no such statement because I've only just written this text and uh, no one has seen it. But I've benefited a great deal, I should say, from the researchers' room, and I'd like to express a general acknowledgement to them. There's one person who I think I should single out at the beginning, and I'm very glad to see he's here today, that's Tony Lyon. Uh, I noticed that he's given a special word of thanks, but it's only appropriate since I think you, a lot of the research under lay the book. And to quote from the acknowledgements, he made shrewd and fearless comments. <laughs> so it's very nice that you're here. So, moving to the first section, income distribution statistics, <coughs> and Titmuss's point of departure was the widespread belief that Britain looked at from 1961, 50 years ago, post-war Britain was a much less unequal country than it had been in the past. Full employment, strong trade unions, progressive taxation, and the welfare state 
had, it was believed, been potent forces for equalisation. And the opening sentence, is the one I quote on the slide, shows said how much had been written in recent years about the strongly egalitarian effects of the policies pursued by British governments since the end of the Second World War. And this belief was based on the official statistics published on income inequality and their analysis by a number of people, including, for example, Frank Page, professor here at the LSE, who said that there had been a very remarkable redistribution of personal incomes, by Harold Lydell, another economist, saying there had been an exceptionally great change towards equality in Britain since 1938. And it's not therefore surprising that you could find a Conservative minister at that time saying, we have a better and fairer distribution of <coughs> income than we had 10 or 11 years ago. Now, on what was that based? This next slide shows the sources which were used by Tetmus. I hope, can it be seen in the balcony, please? That you can see from this graph how the world looked in 1961, the information on which Richard Titmus was drawing, and the central source was provided by the Board of Inland Revenue. And before launching into his critique of this source, he does pay tribute to the contribution by official statisticians to the study of the distribution of income. And that's a tribute I think I would like to echo. I, I've been studying the distribution of income since the 1960s, and in that period, I've been greatly helped over that time by the official statisticians, not least for their willingness to supply data, some of which I shall be referring to in this lecture. And from the picture which the official statistics showed, it appeared that income inequality, measured by the Gini coefficient, had fallen between 1938, when the first blue where appears on the graph, and the 1950s. The Gini coefficient fell from 43 to 36%, a seven percentage point fall. Is that large? Well, just to see what it means, suppose that the way the British tax and benefit system works is approximately like having a uniform tax credit and a single rate of tax, which actually approximately it is today then you can work out, with that and one or two other assumptions, that to bring about a seven percentage point reduction in the Gini coefficient, you'd need to raise the basic rate of tax, the rate of income tax, by more than 10 percentage points. So that would, I think, make many chances of the exchequer pause before raising the basic rate of tax by 10%. And that, I think, gives indication this was clearly a quite significant reduction in inequality, possibly even extraordinary reduction. Now, there's no doubt that these statistics were limited and deficient. And if that was the situation in 1961, of course, we've made progress since then. The critique was of the situation I've described on the board. Since then, we've seen a marked increase in what's available and in the basic sources on which we can draw. In some cases, <coughs> progress was made, and I've sketched on the next slide, as I said, a brief history. <coughs> it's going to be, a, as I said, a rapid tour of what's happened in 50 years. But at that time, even, in fact, as Titmus was writing in 1960, 61, people were using, for example, the Family Expenditure Survey, which had begun in 1953, was carried out annually from 1957. And at that time, Leonard Nicholson was working in the Central Statistical Office on the first of the official studies of the redistribution of income. Studies that showed the distributional impact of the government budget. It showed incomes before the government intervened and then after taxes, transfers, and public expenditure. This began a series that's been published annually since then in economic trends and has been used by many researchers, including our chair this evening, has elaborated it in terms of the treatment of public provision of health and education. A second very important use at that time of the Family Expenditure Survey information was that by Brian Abel-Smith and Peter Townsend, 
in their landmark, The Poor and the Poorest, published, I think, on Christmas Eve, if I remember rightly, in either 64 or 65, I can't remember which. <coughs> and that used another source of information. It used the household survey, already in existence at this time, and which was used clearly to throw light on the lower part of the distribution particularly, which the sources that Titmus was discussing, the income tax, did not cover so adequately. But much of the progress has come from new data sources. And here there's been really a quite remarkable explosion. The Family Expenditure Survey, for example, has been followed by the Family Resources Survey. But before that, we had the General Household Survey. We had the New Earnings Survey. We had, for the first time, on a regular basis, surveys which covered not just households, but also employers. And so we had information about people's incomes from another source, as well as their own reporting. And it's rather hard to imagine today not, not to have a, a source of that kind which carries out and collects information from employers. So we've seen, looking over the time span of these 50 years, developments of new sources and new uses of old sources to greatly expand the information which is available. The situation, the, the scene one now has to survey is clearly a much richer and more varied one. But it's not always been in a, a positive direction. And you'll see I've put in red two events. One in 1979, when the government began to, to cut back on, in fact, the very series which Titmus had been criticizing. That was abandoned in the mid-1980s. And today, some of this information is indeed under threat. The study which I referred to just now, the redistribution of income study, the one published regularly in Economic Trends, is, if you've looked at the Office for National Statistics website, one of the candidates for cutting <coughs> the cuts they're making in statistical provision. So I'll come back to this at the end. <coughs> so what, from all this rich new information, can we then say about what's been happening? You can see now the slides become much more, much more on them. Uh, to some extent, it's a continuation of what Titmus was looking at. It shows that the Blue Book Inland Revenue series, the series which he took when he was in this book, when he was examining the evidence available, you can see the continuation of that series. It's the, uh, now I'm in trouble, I think that's purple squares. Um, right, they call it blue. Oh, actually, it should be blue, I suppose, if it's the Blue Book. But anyway, it's the, uh, you can see there the series which I showed you the first part of that, the fall which took place from 1938 to the 1950s, and then you can see that it continued to fall but then began to rise. You saw then, after 1979, the change in the opposite <coughs> direction, the Gini coefficient, which you remember I described falling by seven percentage points, well half of that fall was reversed between 1979 and 1984. And that's mirrored in these other new sources, the sources which draw not on the records that were used by the Inland Revenue, the tax records, but the sources that drew on the Family Expenditure Survey, that drew on the Household Surveys. It was mirrored in the sources from employers, the New Earnings Survey, and its subsequent survey, the Annual Survey of Hours and Earnings. And so that you can see from this the change which is now familiar, that after a possible period of equalization, a period from 38 to the 1950s, or indeed a longer period shown by the series at the bottom of the graph, the series at the bottom of the graph, <coughs> Julian referred to my becoming interested in the top as well as the bottom. This is the work which I've been engaged in with Thomas Piketty to look at what's happened to the very top of the income distribution. <coughs> the resulting series relates to a very small group of the population, <coughs> share of the top 0.1% of the population, so not the top 10 or top 1, but the top 0.1, a tenth of 1%. But for this very small group, we can trace their distribution of history back a long period, a long period to the beginning, in fact, almost the beginning the last century. 
And you can see from that the same long run evolution where there was a reduction in inequality. The share of this group started at the beginning of the period at over 10%, which means they have over 100 times their proportionate share. It fell down to just over 1%, and then is now again back at over 6%. But to go into more detail of what's happened in the last 50 years or so, it appears that what we've had is, as they say, football a game of three halves. Although, I suppose those who were watching the match last Sunday, it was only two Arsenal players that thought there were three halves. <laughs> the rest of us, it was only, it was only two. Now, these three halves are showing what I've described as being a well-understood picture. <coughs> the second two, number two, which is basically the period of the Thatcher government, and the second period, which is the period of Major and the New Labour, those, that history is fairly well known. But I want to draw attention, first of all, to the first period, the period of the first Wilson Labour government, a government in which Richard Titmuss himself participated in that he was vice chairman of the newly established Supplementary Benefits Commission. His participation was a certainly remember, somewhat controversial. But in retrospect, the record of the Wilson government, the government which began in 1964, as time passes, the record of that government is beginning to look better and better. In fact, taking the two Labour governments together, the one in 1964 to 1970, and the one from 1974 to 1979, this was in fact the only non-wartime period when we saw a sustained reduction in income inequality and some reduction, less obvious, in the rate of poverty. But I think it's worth just stressing when most of what the picture shows is rising inequality and poverty, that actually there have been periods without living through wartime experience when we've actually succeeded in reducing inequality. And that contrasts with what happens since then. And just to summarize briefly the three periods I just described, that was the pre-Thatcher period when inequality overall fell and poverty fell somewhat. The top income certainly share was falling and the top of the earnings distribution was falling relative to the rest of the population. Whereas from 1979 to the end of the 1980s, we saw a rise in all of these measures of inequality. And then putting together, although it may seem rather strange, John Major and uh, Tony Blair and Gordon Brown, this was a period where there was not much increase. There was a small increase in overall income inequality, and there was a distinct reduction in poverty that took place during this period. But the overall broadly level degree of inequality came about because while things were changing for the better at the bottom with the reduction in poverty and child poverty, at the top things were going in the other direction. Both top incomes, top earnings began to race away. So that the empirical picture which we look at from today is a different one from the one which Titmus looked at when he began writing his book. The general belief then was that inequality had fallen. Today, the general belief is that inequality has either increased or stayed the same. But we have to ask the same questions he asked. Are these statistics telling us something about reality, or are we being potentially misled by the statistical evidence? We have to ask whether the questions he posed are valid still today. And I've summarized these questions here in terms of his cross-examination of the evidence. And in fact, the summary is the summary of the is the chapter headings from the book. And my overall assessment is that many of these issues are in fact ones that remain relevant and valid today. 
In that sense, I think his critique is still of today's relevance. At the same time, I think it's possible, and I want to show you how we can do so, to overcome some of the objections that he raised. And I think his judgments were probably too negative, certainly with regard to today, and possibly with regard to the time he was writing. And the book did emphasise the problems. And uh, one reviewer commented slightly unkindly that, referring to his cross-examination, that actually he could have left out the hyphen. Now, it's certainly not the time here to go through all <coughs> of the issues. And I just decided to choose one of them, which is, what is the unit of analysis? What is, who is we talking about when we look at these figures? The distribution amongst whom? And one thing he does is to bring out all the ambiguities when we begin to answer that question. And these ambiguities have rather tended to disappear from the analysis of income distribution data. Even though there are some people, certainly Holly's one in the room, Holly Sutherland, has worked hard at trying to bring them to the front, it's nonetheless the case that when you look at figures like the ones I've just been describing, and you ask yourself, who are we talking about here? It's none too obvious. And in fact, what we're doing is accepting without question that actually we've moved and changed the way in which we think about inequality in quite a significant way. In particular, when it comes to measuring poverty, I, <clears throat> I briefly showed the series for the number of people living below uh, the, the poverty line defined in terms of average income, or percentage of average income. <coughs> that standard of poverty, the one which is quoted frequently in the press, which appears in government uh, discussions about objectives, is based on looking at poverty of households, that is, of people who are living together at the same address with common housekeeping. So if you've got, for example, your mother-in-law living in an extension to your house, or if you've got your, your grown-up children are still living at home, or you're part of a boomerang generation where they've come back, all of you are lumped together. That's the unit that we're looking at. <coughs> what it's doing is then assuming a degree of sharing of resources amongst that unit. In the same way, when the European Union adopted last year a very welcome poverty target as part of its Europe 2020 agenda, you may know that the European Union has set out to reduce by 20 million the number of people at risk of poverty or social exclusion, measured by three indicators, one of which is financial poverty measured on a household basis. And although many aspects of this as an objective have been questioned, none of them, as far as I know, have questioned the use of looking at the household as a unit of analysis. But in the past, in this country, we've measured poverty in a different way. We've measured it by looking at the narrower nuclear family. We've essentially looked at adults and their dependent children, not at other members of the extensive household. It took account of the contributions they might make, but they were treated as separate units. That is, we didn't assume that everyone who happened to live in the same household would be equally well off. We've allowed for the possibility that some people in the household might be below the poverty line and others not. Or put another way, that the household-based figures may be hiding aspects of poverty. Now this is an example, it seems to me, of a critique, of a criticism that was made, which is still relevant today. But as I said, I don't feel we should simply point to the difficulties. And what I would like to suggest is we should take a more positive approach, <coughs> working through these different items, we should seek in each case to say, how can we in fact overcome them? How can we make the statistics re reflect more accurately the reality we want to capture? So to take a, a more positive response, there are several things we can do. I've already referred to the fact 
that we've done a lot to add to the sources of data that we have available. New household surveys, employer-based surveys. We've also, I think, allowed much better access to these sources. <coughs> the increased availability of the individual data, the micro data, to researchers has made it possible to do things that were not possible before. And it's perhaps worth just remembering that when I began research on poverty, and Julian referred to the book I wrote in 1969, we didn't have access to individual household records. They had been released. They had been released in the form, I think, of paper copies of the original expenditure survey schedules to Brian Aden Smith and Peter Townsend. But perhaps because of the publicity surrounding that study and the establishment of the Child Poverty Action Group following that, <coughs> no further access was given to the individual records in the 1960s, as far as I know, and it was the late 1970s when access to these individual information became available. In fact, it was the research program that I ran with Mervyn King and Nick Stern was, I think, the first one to receive these data. We could use them for research. And I'm sure that that has made it possible to do things in a more positive way to try and cope with the problems. For example, to take the issue which I raised just now about the household or the inner family. There are reasons, I said, why we may want to take a different measure to look at the inner family and not assume that the resources are spread, shared fully within the family. With access to the individual records, to the microdata, it's possible then to answer the question, what difference would it make? And this is an interesting exercise that uh, Joe Webb, a student at Oxford some 10 years ago, undertook. And she showed that, indeed, if you were to do this, the proportion of the population below the poverty line would be higher. That is, the use of the household unit was concealing some hidden poverty. But she also showed that the proportion of households, which are this complicated, larger form, with more than one nuclear family, had declined markedly over this period from a third of households in 1961 to under one in five in 1999. And as a result, the difference between the household-based official series and one which took a narrower view of the income unit, that gap became less over time. Put differently, the rise in the series based on the income, the, the nuclear family, showed a smaller increase in poverty over this period than the one for the households as a whole. And I've chosen this example because it illustrates how you can adopt as a constructive approach to actually try and deal with an objection to the, what could be used for the data, but also because it has a contemporary resonance. In the United States, at the moment, um, Tim Smeeding and others are arguing that one of the consequences of the present recession is that it's having an effect on household composition. More young people are continuing to live at home. More people are going to university in their home city rather than going away. More people are staying on living with their parents because they haven't got a job. As the New York Times put it, one way that embattled Americans have gotten by is by sharing homes with siblings, parents, or even non-relatives, sometimes resulting in overused couches and frayed nerves, but holding down the rise in the national poverty rate. And that seems to me is likely to be relevant here as well. The effect is reversing the longer-term tendency that I described just now, maybe on a simply temporary basis. But if we're concerned, as I certainly am, to know what the current recession is doing to the rate of poverty in this country, 
And it may be that by using the household as a basis for doing it, we should be missing precisely some of the groups that are most affected. We may be missing particularly young people, for example, without jobs, and young people without benefits, who we're simply assuming are sharing with the household they're living in, whereas that may not, in fact, be the case. We may, because of the form of the statistics, be missing an important social <coughs> consequence. As Adrian Sinfield put it in his commentary on, on the income distribution of social change, we, he quoted the passage from that which said, we may be prisoners of the statistical houses we built in the past. Now that's one example of how we can actually be more positive about using the data. I want to now give a second example, which is using the information, the richer information we have, to be more forensic in the analysis. Now, of course, the point of Tipnus's book was that the data are measured with error. And that, in some sense, is not exactly news. I mean, we know almost every data or form of data we use in the social sciences have problems, <coughs> deficiencies, shortcomings. And we have developed various techniques to deal with them. One such technique is to essentially partial out the errors, either by assuming that they're constant over time, or, as I want to do here, to assume that if we look at two different series, we can assume, at least in part, that the errors will be common to them both. That is, what I'm showing here, and I'll let me explain it since I want to use it in a moment more, more fully, what this shows is, on the one hand, individual earnings, that is, of individuals not taking any account of who, with whom they live, just on their own. And on the other hand, income inequality, which then is different because it's not just earnings, it's also capital income, transfers, child benefit, etc. And equally on this side, the, uh, the uh, diamonds, uh, those show not only income, but also income of households. So we've got a household-based one here and an individual one here. So these are two different ways of looking at the resources available to people. Now, of course, these may have be affected differently in terms of errors, but it's also at least possible that some of the <coughs> shortcomings of the series are common to both. And so we can look at the relative movement of these two. And that turns out to be quite informative. In fact, if we look at the two, we can see that there are distinctly different periods over the long-run history of this country. I'm going to start off on the left-hand side, before the first of the vertical lines. That was basically the 1950s. And in the 1950s, it's sometimes forgotten, that in the 1950s, we actually saw the earnings distribution widening. It was a time when the bottom D style of earnings were falling, and the top D style of earnings were accelerating, going upwards. This was, in fact, a period of full employment, a period of growth, a period, though, in which the gains from that, in terms of people's earnings, were not being evenly distributed. So from the point of view of the individual earnings, we were seeing rising dispersion, rising differences. But this did not show up as you can see from the, the uh, uh, diamonds, in the income series. The income series, which of course included other forms of income and also looked at households rather than individuals, was broadly stable over this period. So it suggests that there were other factors at work, some of which are fairly obvious in the sense that they reflected social changes like, for example, uh, the growth of two earner families, so that two people in the earnings distribution got married up to form a household, and that those tended to offset the changes taking place in the earnings distribution. But also they reflected the effect of policy. They reflected, for example, the continuing impact of the taxation of capital income through estate duty and inheritance taxes. They reflected the growth of national insurance and other benefits over this period. 
So this was a period when the rising dispersion of earnings was not translated into rising inequality of incomes. And we can see this by looking at these two one beside each other, even if both of these theories have problems of the kind that Tipton's identified. And then moving on, you can see that having looked at that period when earnings dispersion rose and income inequality didn't, the next period they moved together. In the next period, these two showed, in fact, this was the Wilson government period I talked about, essentially when earnings dispersion fell, partly due to measures like equal pay, partly due to progressive incomes policies. And then it was followed by the period of the Thatcher government, a period when the reverse was true. That is, in this case, earnings dispersion rose, but income inequality rose, and in fact rose from 1981 onwards even faster. And that is different from what's happened in the more recent period, when you see earnings dispersion increased and income inequality went up less. And the key, I think, to understanding it, this is the same thing that explained the 1950s, that is, the intervention of government policy. In, pol in the 1950s, policy offset what was happening to the earnings distribution. In the 1980s, it intensified it. And this difference can be seen another way if we look not at the two series in one country, but the two series in different countries, triangulating in a different way, looking at now the comparison of the United States and the United Kingdom, again, to try and <coughs> sort of take out some of the common difficult errors that there might be in these series. And you can see in this case, that this is well known, the United States saw a big increase in earnings dispersion in the 1980s. The UK saw an increase, but not as big. But when you look at incomes, you see the reverse. You see the much discussed United States increase in income inequality was under half the increase that took place in the United Kingdom. So the large American literature in economics, sociology, and politics about increasing inequality was about this much. For us, it was a lot more. And that, again, I think, I, makes it clear that what was happening was not just the common forces affecting the earnings distribution. People often talk about, for example, technology, about the impact of ICT, information communication technologies, on earnings distributions, all of these things leading in a rather similar way across advanced countries to widening earnings dispersion. But those are clearly not the only part of the story. What we also saw is that rather than offsetting those changes, the policy changes that were made in the course of the 1980s, the policy changes that were made then intensified them rather than moderating them. And this is something which one can then, and a number of people in this room looked at exactly the decomposition, Stephen Jenkins and others, have looked at how to break down the changes in income sources that took place. And this, from this one can see uh, a number of the ways in which the changes in social policy in this period had the effect of intensifying the rise in income inequality. So that I think what I think we can do in response to the fact that the statistics that we have are not ideal is, I'm arguing, we should make a positive response in trying to use them, in this case, as I said, forensically, to try and use them in a way which abstracts from at least some of the difficulties which they face in order to draw conclusions about what we are observing. In the last part of what I want to say, I want to turn to social change and to shift the spotlight from income and earnings I've been talking about so far to talk about wealth. <coughs> 
Now, the role of wealth got a particular weight in last year's National Equality Panel that John Hill's chair. But of course, interest in wealth goes back a long way, as you can see from these quotations. And uh, Sir Alan Peacock, who was one of the, I think probably fair to say, friendly critics uh, of Titmuss's book and his review, said that one of the things we should certainly learn from the book is to, to look at the distribution of wealth <laughs> as well as the distribution of income. Incidentally, I was surprised to discover that I found no fewer than 11 reviews of the book, which uh, I think is an interesting commentary. I suspect today, no books, I can imagine, get 11 reviews. I mean, I, they're rather hard to imagine. Uh, but in fact, it was interesting that his book was reviewed in several different disciplines, the <coughs> British Journal of Sociology, the British Tax Review, the Journal of the Royal Statistical Society, and the American Economic Review. So it clearly appealed to a whole range of different people. Now, on wealth, I want to make two main points. The first is that we need to give renewed attention to the role of the inheritance of material wealth. I've listed on the slide two other LSE figures who had quite a lot in common, apart from being both called Josiah. They were both early research students at the LSE, and they both worked on inheritance. Josiah Stamp gave, later on, his presidential address to the British Association on the subject of inheritance as an economic factor. He regarded inheritance as inextricably bound up with the inequality of incomes and wealth. Josiah Wedgwood spent uh, two years studying the economics of inheritance under Hugh Dalton and wrote a book with this title. <coughs> it was obviously, a, I think, a subject of some personal interest, since, as far as I can establish, he was the sixth member of the Wedgwood family to be managing director of the Wedgwood Pottery Company, which began in 1750. And I suppose it's a sign that times are changing, that uh, the Wedgwood Pottery Company, he was the last managing director called Wedgwood, and it's now owned by KPS Capital Partners, so from family business to hedge fund. Now, they, when they wrote, they were of the view that inheritance was becoming less important. As Stamp said, when in 1926, when he wrote, many of the highest fortunes today have been made within the lifetime of the holder. Now, this is something which has been the subject of recent research in the case of France, which bears out exactly what he just said, in that we now have more recent information. And this is from a study by Thomas Piketty, <coughs> which shows that indeed inherited wealth has become, <coughs> over time, much less important. At the end of the 19th century, the amount of wealth passing, so what this is looking at is how much wealth in any one year is passed on either through you're inheriting it through someone's will, or through gifts into vivos, where you give some money to your children or grandchildren. And at the beginning of the last century, it was running at about 20%, an amount equal to about 20% of national income, which is clearly a large amount of money. And when he presents this, he typically uh, quotes from the Balzac novel where Rastinac advises a young man that he has a choice, either train for a career or aim for an inheritance. And uh, at that time, it might have seemed like a reasonable sort of a strategy uh, if you've got 20% of national income passing in any one year. But by the post-war period, by the 1950s, of course, inheritance had as declined even more, perhaps, than Stamp and Wedgwood expected. By the time we got to the 1950s, when inheritance was about 2 or 2.5% two of the amount equal to that of national income, then clearly that wasn't a very sensible strategy to pursue. But the point of Piketty's paper is that inheritance is coming back. And that's the point of the last part of this graph, which is that, that ratio, which fell dramatically, is now making a comeback. Now, is the same true in Britain? 
As part of a, a project which I'm doing with Facundo Alvarado uh, in Oxford, we've begun to look at this in a rather, at the moment, preliminary way. It's preliminary because what we've looked at is the amount being passed in estates, that is, when people die. It doesn't capture what people give during their lifetime. So the graph I'm going to show you next is only for the amounts which are in people's wills. Now, this shows that at the end of the last century but one, or the beginning of the last century, just looking at that, not looking at gifts, suggests that in Britain inheritance was probably as important as it was in France. Probably a lot of fifth of national income, roughly each year, was being passed on. And there was a long fall, fall went on longer in France. But again, there's the beginning of signs of an upturn. That is, the last 10, 15 years has shown this ratio rising <coughs> from 4% to 7, 8%. Not still enough for you to change your career plans, but I think nonetheless enough to be a serious amount of money. And what's lying behind this is that personal wealth is becoming more important. Personal wealth is becoming more important in relation to personal income. And this, by the way, there's a mistake on this slide. It should say personal wealth as a multiple of personal income. And you can see that at the beginning, in the 1950s and 60s, <coughs> roughly personal wealth was about four times personal income. And that was fairly stable for quite a long time. But then it began to rise. And the rise is indeed steep. It's gone up from four, as you can see, to over eight. Now, what's not evident from this, but that brings me to the last topic I want to discuss, is that this, there's no counterpart to this rise if you look at national wealth. The ratio of national wealth to national income has hardly changed in this period. What has happened is that personal wealth has gone up, but not national wealth. And that brings me to the last thing I want to discuss, which is not personal ownership of wealth, but social ownership. Now, social ownership clearly, in fact, means a lot of things. And as Stamp quite rightly, I think, reminded us in his talk about this, that actually what people inherit in their communal assets, the system of law, the body of knowledge, the parks, <coughs> roads, and public facilities, of course, is clearly an important part of what's inherited, as well as the money you get from your uncle or aunt, whatever, and your bequest. So the wider concept of inheritance is clearly very relevant. And as the quotation from James Mead brings out, although he expresses it in algebra, it's a very common, com uh, simple-minded, simple, simple, not simple-minded, simple sentiment, which is that we need to look at the wealth that we own communally, the wealth of the state. And this is very relevant to the current policy discussions about the national debt, and the fiscal crisis. Because the point of the algebra which Mead sets out is that we do indeed need to worry about the debt of the state, the national debt, that's D in his equation. And we need to worry about it being a large fraction of national wealth, which is K. But that's only part of the picture. <coughs> it's only part of the picture because we also need to look at the assets of the state. And to look just at the debt is a bit like saying to someone, you've got a large mortgage, and what are you going to do about it? Well, they say, well, actually, I've got a house, and that house is worth more than my mortgage. So this is really making the same point for the state that we would for individuals. And I make this point because it seems to me, if one were to ask what might have been Richard Tipless's target today, if he was to choose a, a target for his criticism of official statistics, then I think it might well be our preoccupation with the national debt. And we're constantly being told that we've inherited a fiscal crisis because the national debt's 155% of national income, or over two trillion pounds. But these figures need to be cross-examined in the same way as the other figures I've talked about. Now, I should stress immediately, this is not a criticism of the Office for National Statistics, 
who are actually have been doing, I think, an excellent job in terms of pulling together figures about the national debt. The problem is people haven't been looking at the right figures. And the right figures are precisely those which mean for us attention. We need to look at the net worth of the state. This doesn't mean that Britain hasn't got a fiscal problem, but the problem is a different one, I think, from the one which is often taken to be in political debate. And what I've done here is to update some figures which go back to an article that John Hills wrote some 20 years ago called Counting the Family Silver to show the net worth of the public sector. That is, alongside looking at private wealth, we need to look at public wealth. And the top of these lines shows the figure that Mead told us we should look at, the difference between the state's assets and the national debt. And you can see that when Mead and Titmus were writing at the end of the 1950s, early 60s, the state was indeed in negative territory. But that was to change, and over the 60s and indeed the 70s, the net worth rose above the zero line and became substantially positive. The state had a positive net worth. And that indeed was necessary because, as Mead also taught me when he taught me at Cambridge, it had to have positive net worth because, after all, the state has liabilities, particularly to pay pensions which have not been funded to state pensions. And that's why the second line down the blue square shows you what happens if you take off those liabilities. And you'll see that by the end of the 1970s, that again was just about reaching the point when the two things were in balance. They weren't quite in balance because you have to allow for public sector pensions, and that's the, the triangles below that. But you can see that if we didn't know what happened down here, we just looked at what happened up to 1979, we would see that actually the state was on course to dealing with its fiscal problems in that it was acquiring assets. And if it had continued to do that, if, for example, North Sea oil revenues had been put into a sovereign wealth fund, for example, along the Norwegian model, then if that line had gone on going up, then we would be in a situation where those assets were enough to pay the pension liabilities. But the problem came was that we began running down the net worth of the state. The process of privatisation, proceeds used to fund tax cuts, all of this in effect, for example, the sale of council houses, transferred assets and income to the private sector. It was what drove the rise in the personal wealth relative to national wealth, but at the expense of the reduction in the wealth of the state. And this, I think, gives you a different perspective. Not, I'm afraid, a less worrying perspective. In some respects, maybe more worrying. But it's certainly a different perspective from the idea that the fiscal crisis we face today is the result of the last two or three years or the costs of bailing out banks or anything of that sort. Indeed, of course, the banks are a good example because at the moment the national debt includes the fact we borrowed money to acquire substantial holdings in the banks. What that figure doesn't include, of course, is the value of those banks, that is the asset side of the account, which has to be taken into account. So, what I've tried to do in this lecture is to take a more sympathetic view, in some ways, of official statistics on income distribution, in part because I'm perhaps more willing to uh, take on the shortcomings and try and use them warts and all, but also I think it's partly because things are indeed better, we now have much richer, more usable data, we can do things we couldn't do before. But that of course has only come about, and this brings me to my first conclusion, it's only come about because of the investment that's been made in this, particularly by uh, the public sector. It's only because of the work that's been done by the Office for National Statistics, by academics working with them, and others, which we actually led to a situation where we do have a much better view of what is happening to the distribution of income in Britain. It needs resources. And I'm glad to see that the Prime Minister has recognised the importance of statistics in his recent calls for improved measures of well-being. But of course, this also implies that we need to carry on 
being able to produce these measures of well-being and the distribution of that well-being. And to do this, we need not to diminish, as is a risk in the case of the redistribution of income series, not to reduce the information available, but in fact to expand it and develop it. So the first conclusion is one for the statisticians. The second conclusion is about policy in the tax field. And I've chosen to concentrate on the wealth side of the account for the reasons that uh, Alan Peacock and also said that this is one which perhaps are the lessons we need to draw. And in particular, I think we need to address the taxation of capital, taxation of inherited wealth. This is clearly a very controversial and difficult area. There's considerable public resistance to, as the Republicans call them, death taxes. And I think one has to make two points, or I'd like to make two points about this. One is, the first is, I think we should make clear why we're concerned about the role of inherited wealth. I referred to the Rastinac and the choices. The fact that people benefit from inherited wealth is clearly, as it were, a source pay less tax if the estate is divided and if the recipients have not already inherited large amounts of money. It's something which I called a, a lifetime capital receipts tax in the book I wrote in 1972, but the idea is a very old one. I've referred to it on the slide as being a Churchillian. That's not Sir Winston, that's his father, uh, Lord Randolph Churchill, who in 1880 proposed precisely what I'm suggesting here, that is a genuine inheritance tax. The second point I think I should make is, and this takes me back to Titmus's Income Distribution and Social Change, much of this book is about the constant running of the gamekeepers to keep up with the poachers. The constant running, as it were, the difficulties in administering, operating a progressive tax system. And it seems to me that this is something where we tend over much to downplay the role played by social values. And I was struck reading the appendix in here by Tony Lyons on the use of life assurance pension schemes for tax avoidance by the fact that in the 1960s, a number of the life assurance industry took a negative view of tax avoidance schemes. I say avoidance, advisory, I mean legal tax avoidance. And someone writing in the journal Policy Holder at the time was quite outspoken. He said, it's a point of honour for life offices to see that no further attempt is made to find a flaw in the technique of the Finance Act to enable life assurance to be used as a means for lowering taxpayers' liability. <coughs> Now, I don't know if that's a majority view. Um, I did notice that he also wrote under a pen name, so that uh, <laughs> he may have been concerned with what his colleagues would say. But it does seem, and this is my last thought that I want to share with you, is that it seems to me that governments could do more to create a climate of opinion that is more positive towards the payment of taxes. Some governments do. For example, the official report of the Singapore Revenue Authority the first few pages contains examples of where the tax revenue is being spent. I couldn't help be struck by the contrast when seeing a broadcast by the BBC World News which carried advertisements for tax efficient investments. It seems to me a lead needs to be taken from the top and that taxation, which is a policy conclusion of a book like this, is and should be treated as a moral issue.
Peter Taylor Gooby, University of Kent. Thanks very much uh, for the talk, and particularly for the emphasis on the moral aspects of taxation. Uh, the question is really about taking into account state assets as well as state debts. Would it be possible to factor in an element that would reflect the legal capacity of the state to tax its citizens? Surely that's terrifically important in enabling the state to borrow money in the first place. Yes. Um, you mean that we ought to perhaps include some element of, uh, of good will, is it? Yes, I, I think that's certainly, indeed, and of course, conversely, I, mean, I think um, when we think about the taxation of uh, entities like corporations, I mean, clearly one thing one is doing is providing the infrastructure that allows them to operate, and that's something which <coughs> presumably is a reason why one should be at least notionally collecting some rent from them. I mean, the fact that we have a society that operates in certain ways is actually a valuable asset. I wonder if I could ask you to go beyond your um, discussion of what's happening to inequality and say something about the effects of the current level of inequality and specifically what would be your main criticisms of the book by Richard Wilkinson and co-author, The Spirit Level? Yes, I know the book, but I was talking about another one. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I mean, that's a, a very large set of issues. My own feeling is that um, the reasons I'm concerned about inequality are very largely in its own right rather than derivative from other reasons which other costs or issues that may be associated with that. So I, I, one can discuss the individual mechanisms that they uh, treat in the book, but I think the idea that inequality should, is not in itself something we should be addressing but only because it causes X, Y, and Z, which are bad outcomes, is not a view I, I would take. I think that we, it deflects attention from those, where the intrinsic arguments about, for example, inequality of opportunity, which are, I think, unrelated to whether it causes crime or ill health or something that sort. So, I, I think it's a risk of the agenda being shifted in a way by that. There's a gentleman at the back, uh, right. Um, Daniel Pimlott. Um, uh, so Daniel Pimlott from the Financial Times. Um, uh, the, 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 the picture of sort of rising inequality that, that you've displayed since sort of the early 80s is one that's been sort of quite widely felt, I, I guess, across the developed world, even increasingly in recent years um, in countries that you might more normally associate with more equal distributions of income in, in Scandinavia and so forth. And, and a, a lot of that's been to do with, with changes in taxation and, and in public services. Given that direction of travel, is that, um, you know, th those are policy decisions made about how to, uh, partly about how to achieve growth and how to, how to um, you know, how parts of the population should be, uh, whether they should be dependent on the state and so forth. Do you, do you see, you know, that as a... A, a, a false, false policy decision that those kind of views are, are, are clearly wrong or do you think that the, the importance of uh, measures to re-establish equality are more important than, the, than those uh, policy decisions? Right. I think certainly the, the Scandinavian example is, is a good illustration of why one has to be quite careful interpreting what those figures show. As you said, the change to a dual tax system, which means that capital income is taxed differently from earned, means that those statistics are quite hard to interpret. I also think one should just bear in mind that although what you said is true of quite a number of countries, there are countries going in the opposite direction, particularly to some degree, although Robert no better than I do in, in Latin America, I, mean, I think there are some signs that their ch changes in the direction of policy have had an effect in re reducing from a very high level the inequality which one found in Latin America. But I also I think would distinguish between what's happening at the, the top and what's happening at the bottom. And if one takes, say, the European Union, it's interesting that there are within the European Union countries that have seen both rises in poverty, for example, particularly Germany, and countries that haven't and have seen reductions. 
So actually, there are, it's not clear there's a, very, there's a single direction of travel, nor is it entirely clear how that's related to policy, although in the German case, I think it's very much related to their labour market policy and the introduction of essentially very low-paying jobs, which, for example, a route which the French economy has not gone down. So there are clearly are differences between countries and the policy choices they make, which do have an impact on the outcome, but they aren't all going in one, one direction. Sorry, Hartley Dean from the uh, Department of Social Policy here at the um, LSE. I was particularly struck by the, the final point about the, the ethics of paying taxes and how this might square with the whole question of charitable tax relief and gift aid, uh, which kind of um, presents something of uh, attention. Obviously, gift aid <coughs> deprives the exchequer of, of uh, resources, but is something particularly in the context of the whole big society agenda, which is presumably going to be um, encouraged. <coughs> I just wondered what your view on that was. <laughs> well, I've been working with John Bickelwright, who's in the front row here, on the question about charitable giving for overseas development, which is one I feel somewhat happier about uh, in some respects. Um, in that case, uh, yeah, I can see there's more of a, a case for making those tax reliefs. No, indeed. Uh, and of course, I mean, that's part of the charitable um, the extension of the, of gift aid has been one of the ways of eroding the income tax base. Um, it's a tax expenditure of a kind which, uh, certainly if the choice is between that and using tax revenue directly, then I don't think it's a good way to go. <coughs> but it's, uh, there are I mean, some interesting issues I'm not sure how, how to react to about how you think about the ethical position of people who are making transfers as to how far you regard, uh, you take account of their charitable wishes in evaluating uh, their welfare. So it's actually it's a, not an issue I find terribly easy to think about within the domestic context, although the external context development I find it much easier. I think we'll have to stop at that point. Um, one of the, Tony mentioned that uh, Richard Timmers was not keen on economists, and hmm. another phrase he used one of his polemics against them was uh, that uh, uh, they preach value, neutra value neutrality, but then behave as though they have a hotline to God. <laughs> in other words, they're economists as priests. And in fact, we've heard a number of descriptions of economists tonight. We've heard the economist as dentist, uh, the economist as poacher, the economist as gamekeeper, and indeed the economist as priest. Um, I think what we've seen tonight, though, is something quite different. We've seen an economist as forensic investigator, uh, economist as an outstanding academic researcher, uh, an economist uh, in a, uh, uh, investigating and exploring uh, and developing policy. Um, forensic, yes, but not cross in its examination. Thank you very much, Tony, for a, um, a wonderful evening. Thank you. Reception area. The stewards will guide you over there for those.